Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Woodland Hills High School Performing Arts Class production of Sam Hazo's Solos. Baseball has been good to I and my family. Now, I never made the big bucks like now, you understand. But we played triple headers in those days. And it was a good life if you liked the sport and didn't mind going everywhere by train. When I was at my peak, you could put the ace of spades over one corner home plate. And I could pitch a ball over the stem of that ace nine out of ten times. Sometimes ten out of ten. I struck out Musial like I owned him. And Musial was the best player back then. Every time I struck out Stanky, he'd spit at me, which I didn't appreciate that at all. Mean bastard. But he was still a lot better and tougher than you have now with these millionaires. Somebody hits a triple now, and they have to call time, and the trainer trots out to see if the poor little millionaire needs a stomach pump or hurt his little tootsie or maybe needs some oxygen. We played on grass in the sun in those days. It was the real game. Now, it's mostly at night on wall-to-wall -wall doormats with firecrackers and rockets and all that bullshit flashing all over the scoreboard like it's the end of the world or Fourth of July or something. It's all show business now, all money. Every time I try to tell that to Esther, she says, Don't carry the league on your back, Lefty. It's just a way to earn an honest living. But there still is magic in the game. See this baseball I'm holding? It's made in the Dominican. It cost maybe five bucks. When I was playing, I would take a ball just like this. And I'd go into the Waldorf Astoria or the Drake. And I'd slip it to the maitre d'. And just like that, it got me a table. It got me whatever I wanted. Now, is that magic or is that magic? Think of being married to a sailor. Half time in port and the rest of the time at sea. That's what it's like being married to a ball player. You end up being married to the schedule. In training, you're in Florida. That was nice. I liked Florida, but. Then the season starts and you're at home while he's in New York, Chicago, St. Louis, Philadelphia. Early on, I used to meet him on the weekends. After the children came, I couldn't. We used to phone a lot at first, sometimes every night, and we'd talk forever. And to hell with the phone bill. But then the calls were only for emergencies, family matters, things like that. The one thing about being left on your own is that you get good at it, whether you want to or not. You don't have a choice. You cope. You get strong. You even start to get proud of yourself. Of course, you'd still like to have him at home, but you can't deny you like it solo now and then. Then it happens. Retirement. The day he won the game that gave him 200, he came home and stayed up all night drinking beer and smoking the strongest cigar in the world and crying like a baby. I came down and asked him why he felt so bad. I said, Lefty, you wanted this to happen. You knew it would happen someday. He just looked at me and said, Yeah, but now it's happening. Ever since that, he is home with me all the time. We get on one another's nerves now and then, like everybody. I tried to convince him that it might be good to work with my brother Max down at the Banana Depot. But he just looked at me and said, Bananas? You want a 200 game winner to go and play around with bananas? I think of the old days sometimes, and then I think of all those times I ate alone and slept alone. 
don't know why I'm talking like this. I mean, I knew what I was getting into when I married Lefty. I knew that baseball was his life. And all in all, it's been a good life. I can't complain. Don't knock bananas. <laughs> Do you see this ring? 18 carats, six diamonds, and a ruby right in the middle, big enough to choke your Aunt Gert. What got it for me? Bananas, that's what. See that car? Cadillac Seville, car of the year, loaded. A bar in the backseat special just for me. What bought it for me? Bananas. All six of my kids went to the finest colleges anywhere because of bananas. I own all real estate north, south, east, and west of my split level, thanks to bananas. I have my own private box at the ballpark, and I dress my wife like the Queen of England, thanks to bananas. But I didn't make my sash easy. I worked three eight-hour shifts a day in the beginning, outworked all my competitors, drove them into the ground. Now. I have 60 people on the payroll, and my two sons run everything. I taught them what they need to know. I like to keep the business and the family. The old timers, they still call me the Banana King. Eva don't like that. She says, And what does that make me? The Banana Queen? <laughs> She's sensitive. Speaking personal, they can call me whatever they want. But I don't want them knocking the way I make my living. I didn't cheat nobody. I paid for everything cash up front. And I contributed outside to keep the union happy. Sometimes I laugh out loud where I think where all the money came from. Honest to God, imagine a fortune. And it all came from bananas. He keeps buying these things. I have two closets full of fur coats, mink, Silver Fox, Sable. I keep saying, Max, how many coats can I wear? And he just laughs. I think it gives him a kick to buy them. We have a condo down in Sarasota. Twice we've been down there. Twice in six years! I keep saying, Max, why are we keeping it if we're not using it? And he just laughs and says, It makes me feel good to own property in Florida. So what the hell is wrong with that? Whenever you have someone for dinner, the talk is always business, business, business. Bananas, bananas, bananas! I get so sick of it sometimes, I just want to jump out of my clothes and that's the God's truth. When we're alone, I tell him, Max, we're one-way traffic. We need a little poetry in our lives. And he just looks at me, that way of his, and says, Last I heard, poets were starving to death. What do they have to say to us? He misses the point, And I can't make him understand. I don't want things, just things. When the children were growing up, I kept myself busy with them, so it wasn't so bad. But now they're out on their own and I'm at home. I tell Max, it's just the two of us now, honey. And he just looks at me in that way of his and says, Nothing new about that. It's always been the two of us. Do you see what I mean? He keeps missing the point. mother. She's never told me a thing against Pop, but I can see how lonely she is. It's not that Pop's cheap or anything like that. If Mom wanted the Washington Monument, Pop would find some way to get it for her. But he really doesn't understand her. 
doesn't understand what a woman needs. And I don't mean just sometimes. Gifts can only go so far. You know the old saying, it's not the gift of the lover, but the love of the giver? <laughs> Pop never learned that, or else he forgot it. He's one of those men who's identified himself with his job. He puts everything into it, and he doesn't have anything left for just being himself. He can't give of himself, so he compensates by giving things. All kinds of things. I look around and I see a lot of men like that. In fact, most of them are like that. They don't understand the intimate part of life. See, I teach Spanish and the Spanish people have a special part of speech reserved for the family and another part of speech for the public. It's the difference between thou and you in English. We don't use that anymore except in church, but it would really make a difference if we could bring that back. Whatever we do in public, we do to support the intimate part of our lives. The deep part. That's what I believe. Pop can't make room for that and Mom is starving for it. It kills me to see them like that, but, but what can I do? I used to watch her on my seat in the Spanish class. I took the course as the filler. She really loves Spanish. She never gave me a tumble, but a day doesn't pass that I don't think about that girl. We spoke just once, and she told me, I want more than anything to teach Spanish. Some people just learn a language like they learn how to tie their shoe or dial the phone. But she really became Spanish when she talked moving her hands like this, smiling, flashing her eyes the way Spanish women do when they get excited. You couldn't take your eyes off that girl when she spoke Spanish. There wasn't a guy in that class who didn't want to go out with her. God, what a girl. Beautiful, but still with both feet on the ground. Phi Beta Kappa, the works. When the senior prom came around, we all wondered who was going to bring her. She could have had her pick. You know what she did? There was this blind guy in class, Paul. She went, and she asked him to take her. She asked him. That's what I said. And she danced every dance with him. She looked like she was the happiest girl in the room. And Paul <laughs> looked like he had died and gone to heaven. Imagine being asked by a girl like that. And it was all done without a big fuss. No big deal. And she gave people the impression that it wasn't because she felt sorry for Paul, but that it really was an honor for her to do it. You learn to rely on yourself when you can't see. The worst thing is when people try to help you when you really want to do things for yourself. You don't want to offend them, so you say no. You hope they understand, but you know they don't. There's so much they can never understand. Once, a writing instructor asked me to describe something I consider beautiful. Most beautiful things are things you can see. Everybody agrees on that, but when you can't see, do you think how beautiful it is to hold a baby against you or to lie down in your, on your back in the grass and just listen? Only Betsy really understood what I meant by that when the instructor read my paper to class. She told me that while we were dancing at the prom. I really didn't want to, but finally I had the courage to ask her why she asked me to take her to the dance. I wouldn't know if she felt sorry for me. Because if there's one thing I can't stand, it's that. So, she told me. Listening to your idea of what's beautiful made me change my way of looking at everything. That was the reason. Simple as that. And then she kissed me. 
right out in the middle of the dance floor and told me she thought everybody in the room was blind but me. There hasn't been a day since that I haven't remembered that. After she died in that plane crash in Barcelona, I thought about it more and more. It was, you know, her gift to me. I will never hear her say it again. No one will. But she said it to me once, in a whisper, while we were dancing. And she kissed me right after she said it. And that, that's enough. are so narrow-minded, they can look through a keyhole with both eyes at the same time. I can deal with people like that, but these people are plain blind, B-L-I-N-D. So what if I wasn't born here? I know money, and money's fungible. I offered my expertise grants. I explained to them how the city could broaden its base build floating island malls on the rivers, bring in the Blue Angels for a sky show, even get Liz Taylor to come here and hawk her perfumes. The whole line of them. I have the right connections on both coasts to do just that. But were they interested? Not on your damn life. What do they know about promotions? They think small like all the shanty Irish and hunkies and dagos and cacks and all the rest of them around here. Now, if I were some Afro-Americano, <laughs> then they'd listen. They'd be afraid not to. They're just prejudiced against me, and all because I wasn't born here. They hold that <laughs> against me. I told them they better listen to me, or they're going to go down the tubes like Newark and Detroit. I warned them, but they're prejudiced as hell. You gotta be from the neighborhood. If you are, they listen. If you aren't, they don't. Prejudice, that's all. Prejudice today, prejudice tomorrow. Prejudice forever. she made it. She left St. Louis like she was leaving an old boyfriend and made it in Paris, dancing around in nothing but a skirt made out of bananas. She said she shook the dust of America right off her feet. But in Paris, she was something. Vanilla or chocolate or any flavor in between. They all loved Josephine Baker in Paris. She had all the money and lovers she ever wanted. Her name was Money. She made love whenever and wherever she liked. And she adopted a whole rainbow of kids when she knew she couldn't have any of her own. She was the same Josephine Baker she was in St. Louis. But in Paris, she hit the jackpot. I told my dad, if Josephine Baker can make it that way, Daddy, well, why can't I? And he said, Just go for it, baby, if you have it in you. I knew I could sing. Check it out if you want, and the books will show. I've been singing pro since I was 13. When I was 18, I sang with Ellington, Basie, Lionel, Cab, that's all the biggies. I made nine movies after that. Not as many as Lena Horne, but still a nice number. 
I traveled everywhere, mostly in Europe, and I made it to Japan. When my dad died, I came back here for the funeral. I was hot then, so they put me in the best suite in the best hotel downtown. Complimentary. This was the same hotel my dad shined shoes in. For 37 years, 10 months, three weeks, and one day, I felt like running the bill up to four figures just to get even. Everybody's entitled to sell accounts, so what the hell? But nothing ever evens out. Still, life has been good to me. I have a hot single on the charts. A hot single at my age. My race of people look up to me. Anything I need, I can get with a phone call. I have two houses in the States and an apartment in Monaco. I'll suck for that. I don't like to see a black man fight another black man in the ring. No, sir. The only winner is the crowd, and the crowd is mostly white. They just come to see the blood, the pain. They make book on it. I know what you're going to tell me. That's the only way some of my people can make it. So it's OK. Maybe. But I still don't like it. I never worried about my girl. She said, Daddy, I'm going to make it so you don't have to shine another shoe as long as you live. She could sing her way through this world. She did. But I worried about my boys. My second boy wanted to be a middleweight. But I made him stay in school and study shop, because that gave him a craft, see? And nobody could take that away. I don't want to see him end up with his nose cracked and his brains like a bag of bones. See what happened to the best. Look at Joe, Sugar Ray Robinson, Ali. They was the best they ever was, and look how they ended. All them black fighters end up like that. Henry Armstrong, Jack Johnson, all of them. Of course, we have to fight for everything we get no matter. You know what I'm saying? We're all in a ring, whether we think so or not. Nobody's going to give a black man nothing. He's got to fight for it, and he's got to fight to keep it. That's never going to change. If you run a business, you run it on dollars and cents. The workers, the plants, the management. In the end, it all comes down to the dollars and cents you lose or the dollars and cents you make. As far as I'm concerned, losing is for losers. In the good old capitalistic system, the secret is to make. Make as much as you can. And you do this by saving or by cutting a profit. Either way, it's a profit. The money you don't spend or the money you rake in. Why else would we do anything except to make a profit, right? Back when I got started, I did a lot of speculating, real estate, offshore stuff. I even owned a piece of a black heavyweight for a while. But then the black manager started to take over the game, and it was black going with black, if you know my meaning. So then I got into this business, monogramming, all monogram anything, t-shirts, coffee mugs, license plates, whatever. But then I found out that I could monogram a lot cheaper overseas. The Mexicans and the Orientals were dirt cheap. So, I picked up the operation here and moved things over there. I couldn't pass up new opportunities, could I? That's what entrepreneurship means, right? You go with the flow, right? So what are my employees picketing about? Can you tell me that? Employment isn't marriage. It isn't something that goes on until death do us part. If we all believe that, we'd die together. Let the employees retain or move. That's what I have to say. Things change, times change. It's all a matter of dollars and cents. The bottom line. My great-grandfather started this business, and my father and his father ran it. It made it what it is. Mattress covers. The best mattress covers. At one time, more than 2,000 workers were on the payroll, and there's not a single labor dispute in the history of the whole plant. And most of that was chalked up before unionism, before collective bargaining, before enlightened self-interest and all the rest. And it always worked because my dad was fair, and his dad was fair before him. The workers trusted them. But times change, and it reaches a point in the country where workers needed more to rely on than the goodwill of the people who paid them. For a long time, 
My dad was hurt by that because he took it personally. For him, it was a matter of trust on both sides. But I tried to explain to him that the workers were entitled to some say. Their investment was their, that was their sweat, and that was just as important as money. And after a while, my dad came around. Capital is only half the question, a small half. The rest is skill and dedication to the job and turning out good work. And reliable workers give you that. It's all they have to give. It's their capital. When my dad died, I decided to take it a step further. I made the workers co-owners of the business. They share in the profits now. And the books are wide open for anyone to see. It's good for them, for me, for the business, for the country, and that's not going to change as long as I'm around to say so. I saw mattress covers from the time I was 21. I made my living all my life with nothing but a needle. That was my tool, that needle. Never earned a lot of money, but the money was always sweet for me because it came from my needle and thread. <laughs> Even when I was at home, I used to sew on one of those old sewing machines you had to pump with your feet just to keep the needle going. After my sister died, I promised her on her deathbed that I would raise her boys for her, and I raised them on needle money. And I was the happiest woman living because I loved those two boys like my own, and I made enough to make ends meet. We didn't have much, but boys are boys. You can't feed them grass and they'll grow. <laughs> they wore one another's clothes, and they earned money on paper routes, and odd jobs like that. They were good boys, and I made them get library cards so they were always reading when they weren't playing football and working. They made it with their minds all through high school and college. People give me the credit, but the truth is they got their brains from their mother. <laughs> they really made it by themselves, and God kept them healthy. They didn't have an accident like the mayor's son did. Oy. Do you know how happy a woman can be when she sees the children of someone she loved become what she prayed they become? There aren't words to describe that. I still saw on one of those old sewing machines every now and again, but my working days are done. And my heart's caving in on me. I can feel it getting a little weaker every day. I'm not afraid. I'm ready. People always told me that the boys would forget me when they got married, but they didn't. They both married good boys, and their girls take turns looking in on me and having me over for dinner. <laughs> what more can a woman like me ask for out of life? I raised my two young boys into two good men, and I thank God every night for that. I thank God every night on my knees. I feel I did something with my life. In public life, I was always planning. Even after I was elected mayor, I kept planning. You have to do that to stay ahead of the competition, and after years of that, you start to think planning is everything. Well, I'm through with that. I'm sick of that. I, I don't even waste my time talking to people who can't live unless they're planning. They just take the future for granted like it's something they have coming to them. 
But all it takes to end that is to have one thing happen. One thing that you never saw coming. I was coming out of the cellar and I saw Buddy on his bike across the street. He waved at me and started to cross. I was watching him when the ambulance hit him. Afterward, they had measured and said that he was thrown 17 feet through the air before he landed. And I saw it all with my own eyes. I saw him hit, saw him thrown through the air, saw him land on the curb. I don't remember running to him. I don't remember anything at all, except that I held him all the way to emergency. And his eyes, when I looked at them, were glass eyes. His bicycle actually saved him because the ambulance hit the bike before it hit him. There's a police officer there and he kept saying, Let's go, Mr. Mayor. Let the medics take care of him now. Somehow they got him through that first night, but they didn't promise a thing. For six months he was in that coma. And I was there beside him every day, every night, every day, every night. When he finally woke up, it was two in the morning. And his first word was Swifty. That's what he called his bike. That happened seven years ago, this coming Saturday. Seven years and 12 operations ago. But he's back in school. He still can't focus with his right eye. They say he never will. And that scar above his ear where his skull was broken and the brain was actually exposed and coming out, that's all healed and his hair covers that. But he's some kid, I tell you. He actually jokes about it now as if it were nothing. Every time I think about it, I, I can't get my breath. I mean, I actually can't breathe because I realize I almost lost him. All I know is that God gave him back to me. So don't talk to me about planning. I'll take it a day at a time. Work makes you tough, but still you never get used to what you see sometimes. I remember the mayor's kid. He got hit while he was riding his bike, and his brain was coming out of his skull. It was just oozing out. To this day, I don't know how they saved that kid. Some, sometimes, I think I'm getting too old for this job. When I looked in the mirror this morning, an old man looked back at me. I don't know when getting old happened to me, but there it was. When you're on duty in the car, you never know what to expect. And on top of it all, you have to be a lawyer as well as a cop now. Still, it's the only work for me, for all of us. We're, we're just a thin blue line. But without that line, you're back in the jungle. Take this case I had yesterday. The doctor beat the living hell out of his wife. I mean, he really beat her. You remember those middleweights fought back in the 60s? Basilio, Graziano, Fulmer, that old bunch. Each one of them had a broken nose and scarred tissue, and their ears looked like bagels. That's the way this doctor's wife looked. I mean, all of her front teeth were knocked out, top and bottom. So I figured she'd want to press charges against this bastard, right? I figured wrong. She never so much as said a word against him. She just says. He's my husband, and I have nothing to say. And uh, last week, I had to deal with a gang killer. You might have read about it. Each man was shot in the back of the head, in close range, with dumb, dumb ammunition. I can't tell you what a bullet like that does to a man's face when it comes out. That's why I say you never get used to it. 
Sometimes. I think I'm like a doctor in the emergency room. No matter how bad the cases are, you have to deal with them. You can't duck. So you do your job, and you do the best you can. It's just you, between life and death. It's just you. If you don't do the job, who's gonna do it? That policeman kept telling me that I was all right now. That Fred was in custody. Then he came into the hospital later and asked me how I wanted to prefer charges. He said, Your husband's been read his rights. But you have to prefer, we can't hold it. I didn't know how to answer. You may think what you want to think about me, but I really didn't know how to answer. Fred had hit me before. Never as bad as this, but he always apologized, and I knew deep down that he didn't mean to hurt me. He just has this wild side to him. Sometimes he gets that way when we make love, but afterwards he's like a little boy about hitting me. He cries about it afterwards and lets me hold him in my arms and goes to sleep that way. I know I should hate him, but I don't. I just don't. When I look at my mouth without my front teeth, I almost want to kill him. But then that feeling goes away. I had some psychologists visit me yesterday, and I told her what I just told you. And she said there was a name for women like me in the textbooks. But she never said what it was. The problem is, is that I love him even when I know he's just a son of a bitch and even worse than a son of a bitch. That's why love is such a terrible thing. It makes you forgive everything, sooner or later. I used to think it was just women in love who were suckers like this. But it's the same for men, too. Look at Joe DiMaggio. Look at the way Marilyn Monroe treated him. You know that photo of her standing over the subway grating in New York and the updraft from the subway lifted up her white dress? Everyone remembers that. Well, in the first photo, she wasn't wearing any underpants. And Joe was there with the photographer. The idea of Mrs. DiMaggio being photographed without underwear didn't jive with his Italian ways of doing things. And she did that kind of thing to him time and again. But he still loved her even after they split. And when she died, who was there to bury her when all the other lovers and husbands didn't show up? DiMaggio buried her, that too, and he wouldn't let any of the others who just used her come to her funeral. And he makes sure there's a flower on that woman's grave every morning to this very day. A lot of people call him the biggest sucker in the world for carrying a torch like that. But I understand. I sympathize. There are just some things you can't help, no matter what anyone says. You don't want it to be that way, but that's just the way it is. If that makes you a fool, then that's what you are, a fool. much to look at until after college. <laughs> My head was too big for the rest of me and the rest of me was just too big, period. <laughs> I remember in high school when the director of the senior play gave me the part of the corpse in arsenic and old lace, <laughs> just so I wouldn't be left out. She said it was no reflection on my character, but because I was such a good actress. <laughs> In case you didn't know it, it's not easy playing dead on stage. <laughs> but I knew the real reason. Everybody did. Then it was on to college, and I weighed 280 pounds. By then I learned to deal with how I looked. You may not believe this, but ugly girls <laughs> don't have as many problems as pretty girls. I was ugly, so I know. <laughs> 
Ugly girls know what they have to cope with and they adjust. But pretty girls, oh, just look at how many pretty girls are neurotic and end up needing counseling and medication, especially if they're pretty to start with. Well, after college, a specialist discovered why I was so heavy, my thyroid. So he gave me a permanent prescription and the pound started to melt off and I turned out the way you see me now. 110 pounds and not bad in a bathing suit, if I say so myself. <laughs> I hope I don't lose more or I'll start to look like one of those girls in Vogue and Bazaar. Female coat hangers, if you ask me. And they all pose as if they've just been bumped from behind by a little foreign car. <laughs> After I lost all my blubber, <laughs> I really learned to appreciate the shape of a woman. I think it's the most beautiful form in nature except for maybe a thoroughbred horse. <laughs> I'm talking aesthetics, just aesthetics. A woman's all intact and everything makes sense form and function, everything in balance and contained. It's not just anatomy, it's anatomy plus something else. I don't have a name for it, but whatever it is, it takes a lot of attention. A woman's body is who she is. She's not just in it, she's it. It's her occupation. It's all a big political question these days, but apart from that, if a beautiful woman has a sense of herself without being vain about it, and if she has any brains and breeding and knows how to dress and carry herself in public, then she can stop the conversation when she enters a room. And if she's in a position where the world is her room, if she has a stage as big as that, then she can make the world dance to her tune whenever she wants. All she needs is the confidence. The rest just happens. I mean, I could sprint, and I could run for distance, and I learned what running teaches you, to keep your strength within yourself for the whole race, and especially for the finish. I learned that early, and I've never forgotten it. Later in college, Wilma Rudolph was my coach, and she told me the same thing. The work I do now means I spend a lot of time on the phone, and the people I deal with usually don't know that it's a black woman they're talking to. Later, when I meet them, I can see how they react when they put the voice to the face. They try to hide it, but I've learned to spot it a mile away. There are really so few of us who get in positions like mine that people usually are surprised when they meet me. I'm not what they pictured. I don't fit the expectation. In the beginning, it almost made a militant out of me, but I grew out of that. I remembered what I learned as a runner. Just pace yourself and don't be distracted by anything that takes your mind away from the finish. But in time, I even outgrew that because I realized that victories aren't the answer either. The answer is solutions and victories aren't always solutions. In fact, victories are rarely solutions, but genuine solutions are always victories. I've been criticized lately by people of my own race because I'm not strong on black history or black English and all that goes with it. Well, I say an end to ghettos, and not just physical ones. To me, there is only history, only culture, only people. We're not a country founded on hyphenation, black American, Irish American, Italian American. What happens when the mix reaches six or eight? Do you call yourself a Greek, Czech, Cherokee, Swiss, Welsh, German, Hispano, American? It's ludicrous. If Thomas Jefferson were alive, he'd have the laugh of his life. There's no blood basis for citizenship here. Never was. If you're a citizen, it all comes down to your belief in the Constitution, and that's it. I tried an experiment with 50 of my trainees last week. I just asked them, 
what's your nationality? I got 50 different answers. German, Hungarian, Slovak, German Irish, Swedish English, Italian, Greek, Croatian. There wasn't a single American in the group. And I told them that. They all said I misled them by asking their nationality. I said I always thought nationality meant what nation get your allegiance, what flag do you salute? Then I asked them what they'd write on their passport in the space mark nationality. That ended it, but that was not how they responded at first. Not at all. They thought first with their blood, not with their minds. And remember, that was still on the level of heritage, not race. How can people begin to think like Americans if they don't see themselves as Americans in the first place? To me, being an American means being one. And that's something that's very hard and mysterious to be. So you see how far the finish line is, and how far we have to go. My favorite time is spring. The forsythias bloom, then the crocuses, then the tulips, then the azaleas. White, pink, lavender, red azaleas. I swear, all that color, they take my breath. And when the weather gets warm, the children play field hockey, and I can watch them from my window. I love the sun. I love to go out when someone is free to go with me. It's dangerous to go out alone these days, you know. And I think that's just terrible. Isn't it a shame that here in our own country, we can't go out? In the, the summer is the only time for me to go. In the winter, it's so hard. And besides, I have to use the freight elevator. My wheelchair won't fit in the regular one. I stay indoors from Christmas to Easter. But spring means watching all those colors happening children playing and people walking and talking outdoors. It makes me happy to see that. And then I read about all the violence that's happening and I can't understand why people would do that. Can't they see how much beauty there is in this world? Isn't that enough for them? Because I used to wear spats. To me, spats were what dressed you up. Spats in a derby. I gave up spats, but I still wear a derby. Go ahead, say it. The derby's passe, right? But the derby was the best hat ever made for me. The derby and maybe the sailor straw. I've always been my own boss, so I dress the way I want. People say I'm different. But I just dress to please myself. The trouble with the whole society these days is that everything and everyone's too much alike. Even the long hairs and the beards, they all think they're being different, but just look at them. They all look like they have the same mother and father. <laughs> and all those rock groups, the same. They all come in fours, and all the men look like Christ. And look at the people who work in the corporations. They all look like they go to the same tailor. And what about government? Show me a congressman who doesn't look like every other congressman, and I'll show you a congressman who won't be elected next time around. <laughs> Why? Because he's different. All the color's gone. Nobody has the guts to break the mold. And what's worse is that we all think alike, too. All you have to do to be considered a fool is to disagree. And the bigger the disagreement, the bigger the fool they think you are. Personally, I'm all for keep the road safe for disagreeers. 
The way I look at it, we all have a specific number of years on this merry-go-round to be different, which means to be ourselves, since we're all different to start with. As soon as you die, you start turning into a skeleton. And all the skeletons I've ever seen look alike. Even a mother couldn't tell her own son's skeleton from any other. That's what we're headed for. So we have the rest of our deaths to look alike. But why rush the process and start now? In 1958, when I was elected to council, I was accused of fixing the vote. Which I didn't do, I swear in my mother's grave, but they was out to get me, hook a crook. And they packed chambers with all of their hacks. So I started my speech with a line I got from uh, Shakespeare, I think. Oh, what fools these morons be. <laughs> well, I got their attention. Since they figured anyone who knew Shakespeare wasn't as dumb as they thought they were in the first place. Then I sat down. And up stands guess who? And he keeps accusing me of fixing the vote. Well, I say if this is true, then this is something that council, without a doubt, must perhaps absolutely maybe investigate. But he just drones on and on and ended up putting together a resolution, censuring me. Well, I did it. They was accusing my character on that one, and I'll take that from nobody. Once people start believing in windows about your character in this game, you're done. So they take a recess. And I meet guess who in the john. We're both facing the wall and taking a leak, and he's acting like I'm invisible or something. Well, I happen to know that he wants to be a council president mode and he wants his wife on Saturday night. So I told the wall while I'm standing there, that I just might not vote against a certain guess who for president, this whole censure business has dropped out of sight. What he doesn't know is that I know he only needs one vote. But that's all I say, and we zip up and leave just like that. After that, it takes only 10 minutes to get the censure off the books, courtesy of guess who. Then the vote for president comes up. And I'm the last vote. I frown and fret and all that. Then I abstain. Yeah, abstain. Didn't lie to the man. Said I wouldn't vote against him, right? So we've been without a president for three months now. Every time they take a vote, comes up the same way, a tie, dead in the water. And last night, one side has a meeting with me, asked me to change my vote. I say, no, no, never. Then, one of them asked me if I would like to be president, said his side would support me to break the logjam. With their votes and my vote, I'm in. Imagine a look on guess whose face when he hears that. <laughs> politicians? You think these are politicians? Just look at the national picture. Give me the old times when you had people in politics who were definite people, even if you hated them. I asked a man yesterday why he was a Republican. He waited a minute and then said he was because his father was. How do you like that for political philosophy? And the Democrats are so concerned with a group here and a group there that they've forgotten there's even such a thing as the majority, for God's sake. Majorities are what win elections. But in the end, it comes down to the politicians. It's poor pickings now. And there isn't a real speaker in the lot, a real orator. Take away their notes or their teleprompters and they'd forget their names. Give me a man or a woman with a real voice and some real convictions and a genuine belief in what I call public service and I'll show you what can turn the country around. Otherwise it's all PR, all image, all lies. They can package something so you forget what it really is and what it's supposed to do. Take toilet paper, take Kleenex, Nobody mentions the crap or the snot, no sir. And they try to sell the candidates to us just like toilet paper, like Kleenex. Nobody says anything about explaining issues, about convincing people, persuading people. It's all selling, that's all. You know what it'd take to blow all of that out of the water? One honest to God speaker who believed in what words could do. That's all, just one. on the bridge for two hours. They'd said on the news that he'd show up, but I wanted to see him up close. There were some youngsters from a Catholic school beside me with a couple of sisters, 
but the rest were just people like me taking a long lunch hour. And then, all of a sudden, here he comes with two policemen on motorcycles out in front and a lot of politicians from downtown in the back seat waving and smiling and trying to be part of the act. But he stood out with that smile and with a lot more red in his hair than I ever thought. And his skin was really dark for Irish, maybe tanned, I don't know, but good looking as hell. Good looking as a movie star, but a movie star with brains. When I got to the park, he was already speaking and everybody in the crowd was so quiet that it made me think of church. But he got them laughing after a little while, the way the Irish can with that way of theirs. And by the time he was finished, they were all cheering like people at a football game. He hadn't spoken that long, but he was the kind who felt what he was saying and then made you feel it. He had it all, that man. And I don't care what kind of dirt they keep trying to dig up about him now that he's dead. He was my kind of president. He had the courage. And I think he would have done a lot of good for people like us. But he didn't last. God rest his soul. I don't go near the park now if I can help it. They have a statue of him there. It's all right. I mean, you know it's him, but it's just metal to me, not flesh and blood. Every time I look at it, I get choked up. And then it all comes back so real. I see him standing there with all those old geezers sitting behind him. And he's talking like he really means business. And then he stops, smiles and waves. And the wind is blowing the hair in his eyes before he pushes it back. And the sun is making it look redder than anything. And we're standing there clapping for him. And then he's gone. <laughs> Nobody forced me to be a plumber, but I'm proud of my work. For a long time, I thought I was going to be an accountant. In fact, I'm a fully qualified CPA, do my own books. But pushing around a whole lot of numbers every day wasn't for me. I wanted work that kept life going. I said that to my friend Dante, the shoemaker, yesterday, and Dante tells me, Hey, Stush, what people going to do without people like us? We're the ones who fix. Go ahead, you can smile if you want. But what's the most important thing in life when you don't have water? Or when the toilet won't flush? What? Go ahead, answer me. You can't do anything until stuff like that is taken care of. And I'm the one who does it. My work really matters. It holds things together. I used to think politicians were more important, but no more. Most of them just go with the flow or do what the polls tell them to do. They don't matter as much as plumbers for my money. We're a little like dentists when they have to clear an abscess or doctors when they have to set a bone or stop the bleeding. They remedy things when, when there's an emergency. That's what I do. I remedy things. Of course, it takes some getting used to, but what doesn't? One time I was cleaning out a sewer for a guy, and he's standing there watching me. And finally he asked me how I can work around all that muck and slop and not get sick to my stomach. Well, that was my opening. I told him that a plumber's not worth his salt unless he can do that and eat a sandwich at the same time. <laughs> that shut him up fast. And why you think the good shoes? They still come from over there. It's because they still make the shoes from the cow skin. That's why. Look, I've been fixing shoes since I come here in 1939. I know the good shoes. Even I close my eyes, I know the good shoes with my hands. With the good shoe. You put on a heel or so, at ten times, and the shoes, they're still shoes. They don't fall to pieces. Now, I know there's some company. 
they put the paper in this song. They're full of the people. They shine at the shoes. They put some kind of fancy buckle on the front. But they're not full of the real shoemaker. They're a bunch of dumb son of a bitch fakers. And they ruined the shoe business. <laughs> hey, what's the matter you? You take a lousy shoe, you shove it up in your lousy face. <laughs> Good words to come when your hair and your hands and the cow skin, they work it together. <laughs> ah, my friend, Damini Shui, he's a mega disciple. He's a mega disciple walk everywhere, have a Pittsburgh walk on his hands. The shoes I make up for you, they're gonna last. Like Damini Shui, his sidewalk. You son, he's gonna wear them when you go, and his son, he's gonna wear them when he go. My shoes don't fall apart. Go ahead, you take. You try, you wear it, you're gonna see. I wrote every word of this book myself. And on top of that, I made the paper and I made the ink. That's right, I made the ink and paper. And I printed the book on that press. Look close. You can actually see where the letters bite into the paper. That's printing. And I bound the book by hand and I told the leather that makes it my book. You know, I get catalogs from all these book dealers and they're just a bunch of thieves. It's just a racket. Like art museums, they're just a racket. They remind me of warehouses and they're run like banks when the truth is that half the stuff they have was stolen or picked up for chicken feed in Egypt or Europe. How can anyone take pride in a theft or a bargain? And just look at the art dealers! They might just as well be selling costume jewelry. Middlemen, that's all they are. They feed on suckers. And the whole secret of the business is to buy cheaper, sell dear. Real value means nothing to them. But that's what you're dealing with out there. But that's not for me. You can take my work or you can leave it. But there's nothing phony about it. I'm authentic. Over the years, a lot of people have asked me if I believed in the innocence of my clients. I told them that their innocence was irrelevant. A verdict of innocence doesn't exist in the law. All that matters is guilt or non-guilt. The rest is between the client and God, as far as I'm concerned. All of us here at Osborne, Osborne, Lockwood, Bernstein, Petrillo agree on that. <laughs> My duty as a defense attorney is to make it as difficult as possible for the prosecution to convince a jury that my client is guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt. Whether my client committed the crime or not is beside the point. The point is that a plea of not guilty permits the law to happen. Witnesses, cross-examinations, verdicts, etc. And lawyers are the ones who govern those proceedings. A plea of guilty would eliminate all that. It would make lawyers irrelevant and in the process deny the client the full protection of the law. The result of a full trial may or may not be justice, my friends, but it is the law that's served. To be perfectly frank, the main purpose of the law is to prevent injustice from happening. Most laymen don't understand that, believe you me. But all of us here at Osborne, Osborne, Lockwood, Bernstein, and Petrillo understand it. <laughs> There may be a few guilty people walking the streets because of us. Because our defense was stronger than the prosecution's case to convict. But there are damn few guiltless people in jail because we failed to defend them and that is for damn sure. 
course, there are some bleeding hearts out there who will say that our fees are too high. Well, I'll admit, we're not cheap here at Osborne, Osborne, Lockwood, Bernstein, and Petrillo. But remember, we're not just talking justice here. We're talking freedom. Staying out of jail. Who can put a price on that? How much is a not guilty verdict worth to you? The doctor performed the procedure every morning for three years and I assisted. The patients were all from different backgrounds. It was just a matter of ridding them of the tissue as far as I was concerned. After all, it was their bodies and I was a nurse. So the whole matter was purely professional to me. I never really gave it much thought. We were working within the law. but. Last Friday, we performed the procedure, and the infant, a girl, was delivered alive. I mean, she was taken out alive. Well, the doctor turned it, her, over to me, and told me to terminate it. Her. I couldn't do it. For three years, up to that moment, I had no problem. But seeing this baby alive in my arms changed everything. It was different when I couldn't see them. But holding a life in your arms and then being asked to get rid of it like the others will to me, that was asking a lot. I refused. There is a big difference between a simple medical procedure and, well, I hate to use the words killing someone, especially a baby. As long as I couldn't see them, I didn't have a problem. just too young. Maybe it was as simple as that. I was just like most other girls. I wanted to get married. Bruce was really the first person I was ever serious with and I thought I was really in love with him. We liked a lot of the same things and we had a ton of friends in common. It just seemed perfectly natural that we'd get married and we did. Looking back, I think we knew one another too well before the wedding. I mean, there were no personality surprises to anticipate. We were what we were with one another and that was it. No, that's not the truth. The truth is, I misread my own heart. I told myself that I was really in love with Bruce and gradually I came to accept it. Of course, if you have to tell yourself that you're in love with someone or that you ought to love him, that's one sure sign you don't. But in the beginning, I didn't understand that. We weren't even married a month when I realized I didn't really love Bruce. I mean, I didn't feel what I thought I should feel. Our time together was so, I don't know the word, flat. I could see that he was happy, but I was miserable. 
It's a terrible thing when you mean the whole world to someone who doesn't mean the whole world to you. You start living a life of pretend to hide your real feelings. You even do this when you're in bed together. You become a complete hypocrite, but you tell yourself that you're doing it for the right reasons. I was raised Catholic, so marriage means something to me. After a year, I went to see a priest, and I told him my real feelings, and he told me the law. So, I went on living my private lie, hoping that things would change, that I'd start to feel differently. I knew from a couple of my friends that they'd come to love their husbands more as time passed, and I thought that this might happen to me. But it didn't. In fact, it got worse. I would hate to go to bed with Bruce. I mean, how can you be intimate with someone you don't love? And how can you let someone you don't love be intimate with you? That became the real moral question for me. The priest had told me to stick it out for fidelity's sake, fidelity to marriage itself. But I learned day by day you can't do that. When someone you don't love anymore is making love to you and you can't make love back, is that a marriage? You can't be a hypocrite in your heart. It catches up to you. One day, I just packed and left and went to live with my aunt. I had to. I had reached a point where I thought I was going to lose my mind. Well, the effect on Bruce was terrible. He had no idea of my real feelings, and he, he kept calling and waiting for me and writing me letters and having some of our mutual friends talk to me. All I could do was tell him the God's truth. And I could see what that did to him when I said it. And that, that made me feel absolutely guilty because I felt like I had ruined his life. Things stayed like that for a couple of years. I got a job and I kept encouraging Bruce to date and meet someone that was right for him. And finally, he did. And it took such a weight off of my shoulders because of what I'd said before. I felt so guilty. He's remarried now, but I'm, I'm still the way I am. Maybe it's in the cards for me to stay like this. I know what love isn't, that's for sure. But I'd give anything to know what it really is. I mean, to know what it is in advance. Is that asking too much? Does anybody know? We were asleep in this warehouse we used as a barracks. We'd only been in the country two weeks. That afternoon, we heard the president say the war would be over the next day. The president's orders. It hadn't been tough duty, really. Of course, I didn't realize how big the country was until I got there. You might think Saudi is just a big sandbox, but it's a sandbox about the size of Western Europe. Anyway, we went to sleep that night expecting to wake up to a ceasefire and all that. Then the scud hit from out of nowhere. At first, I thought I was dreaming. And it felt like a balloon, like I was floating. Then everything got real. There was screaming all around me, and the walls just fell apart. There was fire. And this went on for a long time. And then there were sirens and voices, doctors' voices, nurses' voices. And then I felt like I was floating again, and I woke up here, and there was a nurse beside my bed. I couldn't believe any of it. 
Look at what's left of me. My one leg's gone. Half my butt's gone. And I think all this happened eight hours before the war was supposed to end. The chaplain said I should be grateful to be alive. He said the 28 of my buddies went home in boxes. I feel for him. Honest to God, I do. Them and their families. Especially Benji. He was just a kid. But I can't help but think of myself the way I am now. All I had to do was make it through that war for eight little hours. Eight hours! That's all! I had a good life ahead of me. I knew it was about Benji when those officers came to my door. Before I let them in, I just asked if it was Benji, if Benji was gone. They didn't say a word, just nodded. I actually felt sorrier for them than for myself because I saw how difficult it was for them to tell me. I'm Benji's grandmother. My daughter died three years ago. Cancer. I thank God she didn't live to hear this news. Benji was the only one who could make her smile. He could do that. He could even make me smile. I wasn't happy when he enlisted. I asked him why he wanted to join. We weren't at war. But there was no reasoning with him. I knew he'd make a good soldier. Some things you just know. Well, the president called me an hour ago, person to person. He told me that Benji died for his country and in a good cause. I let him talk. I didn't say a word to him. He had talked just like he had talked during the campaign. I didn't vote for him or for the one before him, the actor. And finally, I couldn't hold back. I asked him why Benji had to be there in the first place. I even asked him a second time. And he told me that he knew how difficult it was for me, and as president, he shared my loss with me as if Benji were his own. Oh, well, I told him I appreciated the call, but that wasn't going to bring Benji back. I don't care if you call it God's will or bad luck or whatever. My Benji is never going to walk through that door again. But I can't understand why he had to go there in the first place. Why did he? Why did any of them? Before this all happened, Life was simple. It was hard, but it was simple. I had my shot, my family, my headaches like everyone. But after I won the lottery, everything changed. It's worked out so that I get 400,000 a year, forever, or something like that. Do you want to know what comes with that? I have friends I don't need. My enemies hate me even more. I tell my kids that they still have to work. And they say, why? It's taken me a whole year to learn this. But let me tell you something, buddy. It takes training to be rich. You gotta learn that your money's one thing and that you're another. That's the first thing that you gotta learn. But most people mix the two. Like my wife. My wife's always telling me that we're worth more now than we were a year ago. But I tell her that it's all in her head, that we're the same people. She doesn't accept it. She thinks that she's better now that she is a maid. Better? Here, let me show you some pictures. Here, look close. This, this is how she looked when we were working like hell just to make ends meet. Here's how she looks now. She's put on 50 pounds in the past year. I tell her that she's let herself go. And I show her the pictures. <clears throat> but she doesn't accept it. But I accept it. Pictures don't lie. She says. Can I help it if I like candy? 
Can I help it if I like people to wait on me? Why do you begrudge me that? Didn't I work hard all my life? Aren't I entitled to a little luxury? Do you want to know the truth? I wish like hell that I never won. Getting everything you want isn't a blessing, it's a curse. People say that I should be the happiest man living. They say that I've got it all. What do they know? I've never been so miserable in my whole life. And it's not going to get any better. I can't take it anymore. And you better believe it. He acts like winning the lottery ruined his life. I tell him it was God's will that we won. How else can you explain that we were picked out of all those millions? It's God's will. <laughs> Now he's bitching because he thinks he has too much. He thinks everybody is out to get us. And he keeps telling me how fat I'm getting. Well, I can't take it anymore, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I worked hard all my life. I'm entitled to a little luxury at my age. I have it coming to me. He's all upset now because I hired a maid. What's wrong with that? I'm helping someone earn her living, right? And it's helping me at the same time. Damn it, I'm entitled to a little relaxation at my age. All right, I put on a few pounds, uh, I'll admit it. But I've been trying to take them off little by little. It's not as easy to lose weight at my age, believe you me. 20 years ago, I could lose 10 pounds in a week. But what's a few pounds? I'm still the same person underneath. Don't you think I'm the same person underneath? I mean, tell the truth. Am I the same person or not? Does it make me a bad person because I like a few nice things before I die? You can be honest with me. Am I the same person underneath or not? Every time I fly over this city, it's new to me, especially at night. Here I am steering all this power and tonnage off a runway, and suddenly I realize that the line between life and death is as thin as a thread. If anything goes wrong, I'm an inch away from violence. That's a hell of a lot of responsibility when you think about it. Believe me, I think about it a lot. I think about it not just for myself, but for everyone on board. They've put their trust in me. But when we're airborne and climbing, I look down at those lights and I realize I'm just another breadwinner at a higher altitude. The one thing about being left on your own is that you get good at it, whether you want to or not. Every one of those lights down there represents a person. That's what I tell myself. So I slow the climb so I can see those lights as long as possible. It's not that Pop's cheap or anything like that. If Mom wanted the Washington Monument, Pop would find some way to get it for her. But he really doesn't understand her. Doesn't understand what a woman needs. And I don't mean just sometimes. One night I was flying from Chicago to Pittsburgh. The sky was perfectly clear. I was at 36,000 feet. I looked to my left and I could see the lights of Cleveland. I looked to the right and I saw the lights of Columbus. I was literally spanning the entire state of Ohio with a single sweep of my eyes. And I suddenly realized that the light patterns were the same. And if I was over France or Tokyo, the light patterns would be the same. From seven miles straight up, you begin to see a pattern as if everything on Earth is somehow connected, not just the lights, but everything, the lives, the history everything. From sea level, you miss that. But from my pr perspective, it's as clear as new. Then she kissed me right out in the middle of the dance floor and told me she thought everybody in the room was blind but me. There hasn't been a day since that I haven't remembered that. Check it out if you want. And the books will show. I've been singing pro 
since I was 13. When I was 18, I sang with Ellington, Basie, Lionel, Cat, Fats, all the biggies. I made nine movies after that. Not as many as Lena Horn, but still, a nice number. We're all in a ring, whether we think so or not. Nobody's gonna give a black man nothing. He's got to fight for it, and he's got to fight to keep it. That's never gonna change. People would never believe me if I told them I imagine I hear voices floating up from those lights down there. Just bits and pieces. It's like aviation talk. You know, besides poetry and telegrams, aviation talk's the best talk you can find. It's short and to the point. Now, obviously, it's all in my mind, but who knows? Sound has to go somewhere, doesn't it? Maybe it just floats up into space and I'm in the way. And I was the happiest woman living because I loved those two boys and I made enough to make ends meet. We didn't have much, but boys are boys. You can feed them grass and they'll grow. They wore one another's clothes and they earned money on paper routes and odd jobs like that. I love them so much that sometimes I just start to cry. Children don't have to come from a woman's stomach for her to love them, believe me. As soon as you die, you start turning into a skeleton. And all the skeletons I ever seen look alike. Even a mother couldn't tell her own son's skeleton from any other. That's what we're headed for. So we have the rest of our deaths to look alike. But why rush the process and start now? The problem is, is that I love him even when I know he's just a son of a bitch and even worse than a son of a bitch. That's why love is such a terrible thing. It makes you forgive everything, sooner or later. I don't go near the park now if I can help it. They have a statue of him there. It's all right. I mean, you know it's him. But it's just metal to me, not flesh and blood. Every time I look at it, I get choked up. This is a connecting flight. Columbus to Pittsburgh and then to Philadelphia. When we landed from Columbus, I announced to the passengers that our time on the ground here wouldn't be very long. And for the first time in 20 years, I listened to what I just said. Remember what I said about aviation talk? It says a lot, but just a little. Just listen to the words. Our ground time here isn't very long. Forget about aviation talk for a minute. Our ground time here isn't very long. Now what's that make you think about? All right, you can smile if you want, but what's the most important thing in your life when you don't have water? Or when the toilet won't flush? What? Go ahead, answer me. You can't do anything until stuff like that is taken care of. And I'm the one who does it. What I do really matters. I hold things together. But holding a life in your arms and then being asked to get rid of it like the others, well, to me, that was asking a lot. Just eight hours, that's all. I had a good life ahead of me. I don't care if you call it God's will or bad luck or whatever. My Benji's never going to walk through that door again. The rougher the weather, the more I like to fly in it. Space is so big and infinite that you feel like a speck. But when you're challenged and you survive, you feel significant. Look at the size of the universe and our relation to it. It's a pinpoint, but, but when I see those lights beneath me, I get a certain reassurance. It's like the first time I flew solo. Everything before that was just a rehearsal. But every, ever since then, I feel like I'm flying solo every time I fly. Doesn't everybody feel like that? All those lights represent people, and every one of them is flying solo this very minute, whether they know it or not. And everything's on the line, and everything's for keeps. And every time I bring that baby down out, out of the clouds, I think of that. And then I feel the wheels touch down on the only world that we have. And if that's not what com coming home means, even if it's for the little ground time that we have, then I don't know what coming home means.
I can see what I'm doing. Uh, thank you for coming. I would just like to make a few introductions. I would like to thank my colleagues in the class, Mrs. Tallarico and Ms. Zinger, for all their hard work. Yeah. And a couple of members of the faculty from the Language Arts Department, Mr. Reed Burns in the wheelchair back there, and our shoemaker, Mr. Matt Rodriguez. I would also like to thank a gentleman who spent some time with us, who was in the original production of this several years ago. I'm sure he's been in your TV somewhere. He's in a lot of films and movies. Pittsburgh's David Earl. One more. We are very honored tonight to have with us the author of this wonderful work. From Duquesne University, the founder of the International Poetry Forum, Pittsburgh, Dr. Sam Hazo. the opportunity to present this this evening. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you at our spring production of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, if you're interested in tickets, you could probably call me at school. They make great stocking stuff. <laughs> Thank you very much, and please join us in the lobby. Thank you. Very much.